Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning again, everybody. And good morning to our more than 100 people across the nation, I hope. Delighted to invite you back to the second session in F Sharp in Education. And this session is concerned with implementation. So Don Syme showed us about the language. And now we're going to hear about what happens if you have this language and you want to run it on different platforms which is something we're actually quite passionate about. Our first speaker in the session is Thomas Petracek, who has got his master's now from University of Cambridge, where he worked with Don Syme. Uh, it's actually master's from Charles University. Oh, master's from Charles University, and he's going over to University of Cambridge yes. to work with Don Syme. So he comes from Charles University, famous place, and a very beautiful university in Prague and he's going to tell us about how to do cross-platform development with the big system Mono. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I originally thought the name of the talk would be Going Cross-Platform with F Sharp for Mono Develop because that's what the talk is going to be about. But then I thought, well, if I just came and show you that it works in Mono Develop, then it wouldn't be all that interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you could use F Sharp with MonoDevelop uh, for academic purposes. And um, let me just start. Huh. OK. So the first thing that people thought about F Sharp a long time ago is that it doesn't work on Mac and Linux. Uh, that's not true. That was never true because there was always the mono version. So let's adjust it a little bit. Then people thought it doesn't work well on Mac on, and Linux. But that's not actually true anymore as well because, uh, first of all, there's been a lot of work in improving the F Sharp uh, itself. And there's also the open source release, which gives some new possibilities. So let's adjust it again. Um, there's Visual Studio support for F Sharp, but there wasn't anything like that on Linux on Mac, uh, which is quite a burden for people in academia who want to use F Sharp in cross-platform settings. But the reality is that F Sharp has some really great developer tools on Mac and Linux. That's what I'm going to show you today. And that's based on the MonoDevelop project. So. Um, I'm going to talk about F Sharp add-in that I worked on, which adds F Sharp support to MonoDevelop um, IDE. And MonoDevelop, that's a IDE uh, maintained by the Mono team. It runs on uh, Linux, on Mac, and on Windows as well. So I'll start just by showing a little bit about that. Um, MonoDevelop looks like any, any modern IDE. And after installing the support for F Sharp, I'm going to tell you how to do that uh, later. There's going to be a link. I can uh, create a new file. And aside from the, all the languages that are supported by Mono, there's new uh, tab, F Sharp. And I can create F Sharp script file. So F Sharp script files is the usual way of starting with, with F Sharp. And inside the F Sharp script file, I can start uh, writing some F Sharp. So I'll just write a little hello world. And um, I, can, I can use F Sharp interactive. So I can evaluate the code that I wrote interactively. Um, the plugin adds a new path, which, uh, which is used to run the F Sharp interactive. So I can, I can do this kind of things. Um, I can also use some um, IntelliSense autocompletion. So if I want to use system.random, I can just start typing 
hit dot and it suggests all the all the types that are available. So this is this is using the same API as the Visual Studio um, support. Um, as you can see, that's a, that's the dot completion. So I can get some random numbers, and let's evaluate it again. Um, I can also use uh, if I place the mouse pointer uh, over some identifier, it will um, eventually give me a tooltip. Maybe in the next example, yeah. It's yeah, it's um, not as stable as Visual Studio, but it it works reasonably well. And I'll I'll show you some more ex interesting examples in a second. So um, what I wanted to talk about, and I'll use this as a guide la guide to talk about what's what's available in the F# -sharp plugin um, it's what are the kind of possible uses that uh, F# -sharp or what are the possible uses of F# -sharp in academia and what's possible thanks to the mono develop add-in so first of all um, first of all um, the mono develop, mono develop add-in that runs uh, on multiple platforms, it can be used on Mac and Linux. And it, this means that uh, students or researchers who want to use F# -sharp will have roughly the same user experience on all the platforms, um, which is quite important. Um, the F# -sharp integration for mono develop, uh, it's not currently aimed at large-scale business applications. But I believe it's very, very good enough for universities to use for teaching or research. And the kind of uses I can imagine is um, teaching functional programming or teaching programming using F# -sharp. So I'll show you one example of that. Um, then doing some data processing, which is another area where F# -sharp works really well. And um, also you can use F# -sharp and the MonoDevelop work to do your own functional programming research um, because you can modify the open source release of F-sharp and uh, build the mono develop add-in on, on top of that. So I'll, I'll show that in a, in a second. And I'll start with teaching. So F-sharp is a great language for teaching because it's, uh, you can start with very simple concepts and the students don't actually need to understand that many things to start creating some pretty impressive uh, things. So you can, you can have, give your students a library that allows them to do some really impressive things. And it, when, when it's fun to use it, they will probably uh, enjoy the teaching process much more. Um, so I'll have an example of that. And I created a simple library that's using OpenGL. And it's composing 3D objects from various uh, functional primitives. So I'll just close this, this project. And I'll open an existing library. I'll show you how to write some, some basic samples using it. Uh, this time I'm loading a project. The mono develop add-in supports projects as well. Um, and I'm not actually using all the project system in this example um, because I'll, I'll be still using script file, but I have one library which is in the project and I will start by loading the library. So this is just loading some OpenGL library that I wrote. Um, that's something we don't need to know much about. Um, all we need to know is that it's there and we can start using it. So the library comes with a single module called fun. And if you hit dot, you'll see what are the basic building blocks that we can use. Um, so there's cone, cube, cylinder, some graphical objects. There are some functions that I'll, I'll show you later. So let's start, for example, with sphere and if I uh, send this as a command to F# -sharp interactive it will uh, automatically show me the object 
So this is a sphere. Um, yeah, I'll need to find a good way to switch between windows. Okay. So um, another object that we get here is, for example, a cube. That's a cube. I can the, the the window allows me to do some rotations of the thing and so on. Um, there are some other functions that I can use. For example, fun dot uh, color that takes an existing object and allows me to set it a change the color of the object. Again, I can use the nice features of um, IntelliSense here. So this will create a yellow cube. Um, and as the next thing, I can also uh, move things around. So um, if I want to move the sphere from the center of the view somewhere else, I can use translate function, which takes a couple of numbers specifying the offsets. So this will create a sphere because of the rotation that I did in the in the our view, it's rotating with a different center of rotation. And the last interesting thing in the library is that I can compose things using the dollar operator, which is also defined in the library. So this way I can create multiple, compose various, fun various um, graphical objects. And the composition, it's, it's very functional. That's what I really like about the library is that this uh, this is just an expression. It doesn't use any complicated functional things. It's just an expression. It's just just like mathematical expression one plus two, except it's much more exciting than that. So that's the introduction to the library. And I have a little example that I created to demonstrate what kind of things the students could very easily do with the library. Um, so this tower thing. That's a function. OK, we are introducing one functional concept, a function. It takes two numbers that specify location of the object and returns drawing 3D, which is the type that I used to represent the drawing. So it creates some cylinder and a cone and puts them together to create something that looks like a tower. And we can call the function twice to get two towers. Um, so that's, that's very simple to write. And it all, it, that's something you could show in the first lecture. And it's already something that I would like to play with. Um, the next example is showing some more complicated functional th uh, things. Uh, these two functions, that's just to compose uh, something like stairs, uh, putting two cubes together. That's not very exciting. But then uh, this little piece of code here that it generates using sequence expressions. <coughs> it generates eight of these uh, stairs, puts them next to each other uh, using the translation. So we just compose eight of these. And then we can use higher order functions, seek.reduce, which is one of the basic things that you will teach when teaching functional lists. And that takes all the elements in the generated lists and composes them using the dollar operator. So that means we take all the elements, put them into a single, single object, and then we do some scaling of the object and uh, set it a different color. And eventually, we'll get something like this. And again, this was. Very, very easy to write, just using basic sequences and one higher order functions. And of course, we can put this together to get something like this. And this is really something you could do with only two basic functional concepts. So that's what I find very, very exciting. The second area where I imagine people could use F-sharp really well 
And Don already talked about that a little bit, is processing of scientific data, and doing some data analysis, and so on. And I'll have, again, another example that you can do this in, in MonoDevelop perfectly fine as well. Um, as Don already mentioned, um, F Sharp is great for this kind of development because you can start very easily to do some things. And using the F Sharp interactive, that's that's really important point here. Um, units of measure are one of the many features that F Sharp has to make this easier and safer to write this kind of code. And there are many, many people who already used it, use F Sharp in this way. Um, so I'm going to show you that you can do um, this kind of programming in MonoDevelop as well, uh, using Mac or, or Linux. So I'll switch down here. And this is a Linux running in virtual machine. So it's really a cross-platform talk. And I'll start the MonoDevelop again here with the F Sharp plugin installed. You can see that the plugin is there by the F Sharp interactive window. And I'll just use um, one example, a script file again, which I created earlier. And I didn't know what Don is going to talk about during the first talk, but it turns out he stole my example. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to show you that what he said actually works and that it actually works on, on Mono as well. So the example deals with some financial um, data, some stock pricing, and I wanted to show you that you can use asynchronous workflows, but I didn't get uh, the internet connection to work in the virtual machine, so I'll just download the data from file. That needs some asynchronous programming as well, actually. Um, and I'll start with declaring a simple type to represent the stock history. So here's a type, stock price. Um, as you can see, there's the IntelliSense with all the information. We have high, low, open, and close prices, which are uh, using units of measure. So the price is actually in dollars. And I'll just... Um, not to take too much time with this. Uh, this is just using asynchronous workflows to uh, load the data and parse the data. So I'll, yes, I forgot to ev evaluate the first bit of the example, so I'll need to do that. OK. So the download function, let's just use IntelliSense to figure out what it does. Um, it takes a string, which is the URL, uh, which is the name of the, of the stock, and asynchronously gives us uh, some data downloaded from Yahoo website. The parse lines function takes a sequence of uh, lines and generates stock price array. So it parses the, the content. Um, it's worth noting that this parses the data into floats of dollars, so it's typed including the units of measure information. And then I'll just run this, run this little piece of asynchronous programming code to get all stocks. And that's what I'm going to work with. So all stocks is just an array of stock histories. It contains um, historical values for Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft. And we can start using this. Now, when you download the data, you'll probably want to explore it first. So this is a function. The, eva the highlighted part of code um, prints average price for each of the, for each of the stocks. So there's average values. Um, then we may want to calculate variation, variance. Um, so I'll do that. And as you can see, the variance has a type USD power to two, because that's, the, that's what variance, variance means. And the thing that I had prepared here in the, in the virtual machine 
is that what if we wanted to calculate um, the range of the the yeah the, the range of the value? So if we write something like min max um, equals average value plus variance, uh, that's going to be minus variance, and the second one is going to be average value plus variance, and let's print the the range. Um, you can see that there's the red highlighting, which is actually some error. Uh, and there's the, the same thing that's running in Visual Studio is the background, background type checking and compilation. That's reporting errors here. So as you can see, there's an error because we cannot subtract dollars squared from dollars. So I'll have to fix it and use a square root of variance which is the standard deviation. And the type of SDV is dollars. So I can just use it here. And now the error, when it type checks again, it disappears. And I got the results I wanted. So that was, that was um, some analysis of the data. The next interesting thing that you can do is to call some cross-platform uh, applications from your F-sharp code. And I'm going to show you how to call gnuplot, which is quite a popular plotting library. And I'm not going to do that directly by starting the process. I wrote a little wrapper, and there will be a URL where, where you can get it. And that wraps the gnuplot API into some more F# -sharp friendly um, user uh, F# -sharp friendly type. So this GP is some type that represents the GNU plot, GNU plot process. It has various um, methods. So plot method is the obvious, the most important one, and I can use it to plot a simple function. That's a basic example. I can also use it to plot some data coming from F sharp. So this is taking um, all the closing values of Google stocks and turning this into a lines series and then sending the series to GNU plot. So if I run this piece of code, I'll get the value. Um, it's actually in the other way around because the, the most current value is there. Uh, so don't worry, your Google stocks are doing fine. Um, I'll reverse the data in the next example, so we'll get a better view. Um, or I could fix it just by adding list.reverse. It's quite easy to do. Um, but let's do something more interesting. Uh, let's get the. Uh, stock the closing values for the last uh, year, and let's reverse it to get the correct order. And then we take, um, we iterate over the all stocks, which is for Google, Yahoo, and uh, Microsoft, and we'll generate a single line, se line series for each of those, and get the data for the last year. You can set some additional GNU plot properties like title and width of the line. So if I run this piece of code, you can see that it's not actually all that interesting because we can see Google prices quite nicely, but the other companies are actually a little bit, little bit lower. Um, we can fix that easily by setting log log um, logarithmical scale, and that's showing you that you can uh, send any command to GNUplot as well. So the library is a wrapper, but it still gives you the full control you may want. And if we plot it using the logarithmical scale, the results look much, much better. So that's another example where I can imagine people could use F sharp. And let's move on to the last one. And that's programming language research with F sharp. So um, if you're, if you're doing functional programming research, or if, you're, if that's something you're interested in, then 
inventing some new nice programming language, that's the easy part. And getting someone to use it and play with it and give you some feedback, that's the difficult part. Um, so many people do some experimental extensions of languages. There, were, there are many interesting projects like this. Um, but then if you create new extension to C Sharp, you want to have some editor. And people from the non-academic world expect that they'll get some intelligence. And they'll be able to use it nicely as any other language. And that's, that's quite difficult to get. Um, if you if you're doing some, if you want to extend and experiment with F Sharp in some way, uh, then you can use the open source release of F Sharp. There's going to be talk about that uh, right after uh, after me. And the release comes just with command line tools, um, and it doesn't uh, give you a way to modify F Sharp and use that in Visual Studio. But you can use the modified version of the language with MonoDevelop, and that's that's quite easy to do. Um, so all the features that I were showing in, in MonoDevelop, when you modify the language and add, make sure you don't break anything, um, which is not that difficult uh, in, in some modifications, uh, then all the features in, in MonoDevelop will just work because it's based on the F# -sharp compiler. Uh, there are some, some existing F# -sharp extensions. There's F7 project, which adds some tricky type checking, allowing people to verify some security protocols. Uh, the other project, JoinAds, that's an extension that I worked during. I worked on during an uh, internship with Don Syme. And that adds a language feature that allows you to do uh, some tasks in reactive, concurrent, and parallel programming. And in particular, it, it extends the computation expression mechanism that uh, Don was showing. So I'll, I'll show you an example of that. So this is running, again, the MonoDevelop add-in for F Sharp, but it's the, the F Sharp version that's installed on this machine. That's one that's modified. Uh, it's not actually done using the open source release yet. It's done using some uh, the, the, the source codes that were available before. Uh, but it should be much easier with the open source release. And I'll show you just the second example, which is more exciting. So I'll, I'll run the example first to show you what it's doing. And the problem that uh, I'm trying to solve here is that when you have asynchronous workflows, as you saw from Don's talk, you can use the let bank uh, language construct to wait for one task, one asynchronous workflow, one download, or one user interface event. But sometimes you want to wait for multiple things or one of several things. And this application, that's a simple program for drawing rectangles. So when I start drawing, I can see the, uh, that's the outline of the rectangle. And now a uh, few things can happen. I can hit Escape key to cancel the drawing. Or I can move the mouse button, mouse, to change the location. Or I can release the, the uh, button, and it will draw the rectangle. And this is not that easy to implement using a uh, lead bank, because I need to wait for three uh, different events. And I'll just scroll down to the part where that's actually happening. Um, yeah, running three virtual machines is not the best idea. But there's um, waiting, this, this waiting function that represents the part of the computation when we are waiting until the user starts drawing. And then there's another part which I'd like to show you. Um, OK, I'll, I'll see if it starts working. Um, let's look at the first line. Um, the drawing function, that's a, that's, that represents the state of the computation when we are um, 
when the user is drawing something, and we need to wait for three, uh, three different events, either mouse move to update the current location, or mouse up or key down. Um, in the case of key down, we are only interested in the case when uh, the key was escape key. And yes, I lost the screen as well. <laughs> hmm. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll hope that the slides will appear eventually. Uh, that was the that was the last example. Um, if it starts working, I can show it to you later. Um, the the la the point of the last example was that you can actually modify the F# -sharp language and get that working in in Mono Develop. So the people who want to try your language extension will get the full full uh, support of the IntelliSense. And even if they do some change in the language, like adding match bank construct, um, they will be still able to get the full, full IntelliSense support for that. Um, and that was, the, that, was, that was supposed to be the end of the talk. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, I have been working on two websites about F# -sharp, uh, in in academia. The URLs, which I cannot show you on the on the screen, are functional-variations.net um, and functional-teaching.net. Yeah. And the purpose of these sites is just to give people some information about F# -sharp in, in academia. Um, it's my personal project. I would really like to get more community involved in that. So if you're using F# -sharp for teaching, uh, definitely let me know. Or if you're interested in doing some research about F# -sharp, uh, the the websites currently just contain links to some uh, some projects that I found, or some uh, lectures about F Sharp. Uh, but it's, it's based on some wiki. So um, if, you, if you let me know, uh, I can give you right access. And it would be really nice to have uh, some web where people interested in using of F Sharp in, in academia could go to and find some information and help how to start and what materials are available. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to see, yeah. if you want to see Match Bank in uh, Mono Develop, come to me after the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we could steal a little bit of time from lunch, so I'm going to take a couple of questions. Have are there any over there? Yeah. Yes, um, there's, yeah, it's, it's not actually there yet. Uh, there's a source code for that. That's, that's on CodePlex. Um, so you can, you can get the source today. Um, it requires um, some fixes in the F# -sharp compiler to work really good. Um, so they're coming out today. OK. So that's the, that's the announcement I didn't want to make because I'm not a member of the team. But if you download the version of F# -sharp that's going to be released today, uh, we'll, we'll build, I'll, I'll build a ver version of the, of the package for, for MonoDevelop. So the, the way to install it is just to go to add-ins, install. There's 
very nice mechanism for installing packages from repository. And the repository is going to be on the functional dash variations website for now. We're hoping to, to merge it with, to add it to uh, the official uh, repository mono add-ins, but that's still work in progress. Okay, last one, and then we'll we'll take more during the panel session as well. Yeah. Um, well, that's not really. What there, there's, there are quite a things, few things that Mono itself provides, and it's, it's capable of running quite a lot of .NET, .NET API that people usually use in, in C Sharp or F Sharp. Um, the application that I was, I was uh, the drawing of rectangles that was written using WinForms, uh, which is standard uh, .NET library that works on Mono as well. Uh, no, it's it's running using the standard F# -sharp compiler running on on Mono. Um, yeah, F# -sharp compiler runs on Mono, and the uh, what the Mono develop integration does is that it just calls the some API in the compiler. So it didn't take long time to to do the integration. Yeah. Thanks. Great, thanks. And uh, before our next speaker comes up, that's Joe Pema. I just want to mention that there are many famous uh, Seattle companies like Microsoft, Costco, Boeing, uh, Amazon, but one of them you might not know about is Huntley, Brown and Haley, and Brown and Haley make these delicious chocolates, so thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so now we have our um, speaker, our second speaker in this session, who's Joe Pamer from the development team in Microsoft. And he's a development lead uh, in the F Sharp development team. And he's going to tell us about source drops and, in particular, what happens with an open source drop, which has just happened yesterday. Can you hear me? All right, so um, thanks for having me today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Joe Pamer. I'm the development lead for the F-Sharp team at uh, Microsoft Developer Division. Um, as you might have noticed, uh, the agenda said I would be talking about F-Sharp from a Mac user's perspective, but I think Tomas covered that beautifully. Um, so this talk isn't necessarily about the Mac, although it is about today's open source release, which really is for everyone. So basically, um, this talk, I'm going to move through things rather quickly because there's a lot to cover. So feel free to grab me later if there's anything you want to dive into. Um, really what the purpose of this talk is, is to give everybody a nice overview of today's open source release, what we're you know, giving to the community, um, the architecture of what's there, and some pointers of places to look if you're interested in diving deep into the compiler or runtime implementation. So um, yeah, just grab me later if you have any questions. So first off. Um, as was pointed out earlier, you could find the open source drop at the um, F Sharp Power Pack uh, CodePlex website. Um, just some logistics there, um, as also Don mentioned before. Um, we're, this isn't necessarily a, um, an active drop in development. Like developers on my team aren't going to be checking in their changes day to day there. It's going to be synchronized with our releases with Visual Studio. Um, we won't be accepting submissions, and this also won't be supplanting the free tools releases like uh, today's, for instance. This is 
more for people who want to dip into the code, see what we're doing, utilize what's there, and um, just keep the development nice and open for things like uh, running on Mono or other third-party platforms. Um, just to touch briefly on it, we have changed the license from what was previously available. The source code has always been available and distributed freely with our um, free tools releases. But right now, we're actually going to be, re it is released under the Apache 2.0 license as opposed to the MSR one we had before. And the Power Pack has been changed to Apache 2.0 as well. Um, so now diving right in, I just want to talk uh, for a few moments about what it takes to build the drop that we've provided. Um, so the prerequisites, if uh, once you've actually downloaded the tools, um, is to first have some version of the F Sharp, recent version hopefully, of the F Sharp compiler and runtime installed on your system. Um, today's free tools release would work beautifully for that. Um, and also, for now, some version of MS Build, the, either the Microsoft one or the one provided by Mono. Um, I've heard today that there were some problems building on, like uh, bootstrapping the compiler on Mono using that provided MS Build. So um, I'll, at some point today, I'll be updating the README that's uh, been distributed with the open source drop to talk through how you can do it without actually using MS Build, just using straight command line invocations of the compiler. Um, so just a couple of things I want to touch on about the build process that I think are interesting. And, um, first is that it's a two-stage build process. First, you build a prototype compiler using the last known good compiler, the LKG. Um, so you would use basically the free tools drop to build a constrained version of the compiler against um, .NET 2.0 that would then be used to build the production compiler or runtime that anybody can play around with. Um, this has proved immensely useful to my team because it gives us a great you know, early on validation of if we've caused any regressions in the compiler or any bugs or anything like that. Uh, and right now it's also the principal way to test any compiler changes that you may make. Um, as I'll touch on later, we've also released unit tests for our runtime and MS build task. Um, we don't have any unit tests out there for the compiler, but if um, since the compiler is a great example of canonical large F-sharp projects. If you can build and execute the compiler through the prototype phase, then you, have, you can be reasonably well assured that the changes you made are, were OK, as long as they're within the scope of what's used in the compiler, of course. Um, and also, the generated assemblies from what you build from the open source drop are not strong name signed, which means that you can't add them to the GAC. Um, so now just to talk a little bit about what you'll get when you build the open source drop. Um, so you'll get the compiler and the REPL loop. Um, these are the various assemblies here, FSC, EXE, FSI, EXE, the compiler, and drive settings, and the server. Um, and those are some pointers to where you can find the source code for each of these in the drop. Um, later on, I'll be kind of walking through what the compilation process of F# -sharp looks like. And um, you know, we can touch on a little bit there of uh, you know, specifically at each stage what files are brought in. But if you're interested in just kind of taking a dip into you know, what makes up our REPL or you know, what makes up the front end of the compiler, you can check those locations out. Um, the, our language runtime, F# -sharp core DLL, uh, the source is located, F# -sharp core. I won't be talking about the runtime as much today, but feel free to grab me later if there's anything that you'd like to discuss. Um, the MS build task that we use to actually bootstrap the compiler. Um, and of course, unit tests. And as I mentioned, um, we aren't shipping any unit tests currently for the compiler. We do have pretty good coverage of the runtime, the MS build task. Um, but for now, you can just bootstrap, and it's, you should get adequate coverage there. And the, as Don mentioned earlier, the unit test harness that we're using is NUnit, which is based off of XUnit, I believe, a .NET transliteration of it. Um, and another thing worth noting is that this isn't just for the desktop CLR mono. Um, you, if you look in the readme, there are ways to configure the build to build our runtimes for both Silverlight and Compact Framework. And it's easily tweakable. So if there's anything else you'd like to build for, it should be pretty straightforward just to provide the necessary incantation to do so. All right, so um, now we're just going to move into basically a high level, or you know, sort of a high level view of you know the exact source code and components that we'll be providing, um, how the pieces fit together, and then if uh, there are any more .NET centric hackers in the room, you know what you might find interesting or useful, just you know even outside of the context of F Sharp, uh, what tools that um, you might be able to just kind of use in your day to day workflow. Um, as I said before, there's a lot to talk about. I'm going to be moving fast and high level, but feel free to pull me aside at any point uh, later on, and just if there's anything specific about the language you want me to point out, or if you'd like to explore yourself. So to start, uh, I want to touch on the compiler a little bit, uh, what the architecture of it is, and what the compiler really means to us. Um, Tomas was asked before about you know whether or not he had to port the compiler um, to Mono to run, and one of the reasons why we, you know, we are able to run on Mono and in other environments like Silverlight is that the compiler is 100% managed, meaning that it's all written in .NET 
IL. It's, uh, it's the compiler itself is bootstrapped in F# -sharp code. Um, so in addition to providing a good example of F-sharp coding style, it also allows us to basically port the compiler, not easily, but in a relatively straightforward fashion to any kind of um, managed in, or .NET environment that we come up with. Um, the shape of the compiler is essentially there's a core assembly, F-sharp compiler.dll, which has most of the compiler, you know, actual compilation logic, um, basically anything to the middle, to the back end of the compiler. Um, it has two backends, one that generates static .NET assemblies, what we refer to as the IL write backends, and another that uses .NET reflection to dynamically emit and evaluate code on the fly. That's what's used by a REPL, for that is IL reflect. Um, on the front end, there's actually two executables that sit on top of the compiler, the, um, the command line batch compiler, fsc.exe, and the REPL, fsi.exe. And it's also worth calling out that as part of the sort of the front end of the compiler DLL, we have the source code services APIs, which is what could be used, for example, to plug into Mono Develop or any other third-party libraries. Um, so just kind of drilling down a little bit, uh, fsc.exe is the batch compiler that we use you know, to uh, compile F-sharp source code. Um, there's, it's more or less a canonical, straightforward uh, command line compiler. There is a resident feature that we utilize extensively on Mono to have it run in server mode to um, sort of circumvent any kind of JIT issues or startup time that we may have. Because the compiler itself is actually written in F-sharp and it's written in a very functional style, um, the amount of closure classes and things like that that need to be JITted on you know, boot up for the compiler can be significant in some environments, um, which is one of the reasons why, if you look at the readme, we suggest you NGEN the compiler, which is um, NGENing, for those who don't know, is a, a way on .NET to sort of um, pre-compile to native code, some of like basically to pre-JIT some of the code to kind of um, amortize the cost of, of JITing and, and startup. Um, another interesting point about the compiler is that it can down-target .NET runtimes, what's often referred to as multi-targeting. So for example, you build the compiler for, F -sharp, or for .NET 4.0, you can still produce .NET 2.0 assemblies if that's the environment that you're running in. Um, the interactive REPL, fsi.exe, uses the IL reflect backend, as I mentioned before, by basically spinning off uh, fragments of code dynamically into memory, compiling them, and then executing those entry points. Um, there are a couple of support assemblies that are included in the drop, um, interactive settings and server shared, which are used to sort of manage the event loop for FSI and allow you to plug FSI directly into other third-party environments using remoting. Like, so, for example, our Visual Studio tools actually has an f -sharp process, kind of um, FSI process running in the background, and we use .NET remoting to um, display the output and take input into a, a tool window inside Visual Studio. Um, so another thing that's worth mentioning that might be useful to some people is that uh, the compiler DLL, which sort of sits in the middle and provides most of our compilation services, um, is fully .NET, but it also reads and writes .NET IL bits to bits. And what that means is um, a common way for compilers on running on the .NET platform to both consume and emit IL is to use uh, interfaces or libraries that are provided by the platform. For example, iMetadata Reader and iMetadata Writer. Um, because of the lineage of the F-sharp compiler, we actually do everything ourselves. So um, in addition to being a metadata reader writer that write, runs completely unmanaged code, it's actually, um, if you're looking for ways to kind of, other interesting ways to kind of work with um, IL, uh, both reading and writing, or doing any kind of analysis over .NET IL, um, the f both the front end and the back end of the compiler are a good place to look for hints, or also to actually kind of easily separate that. Um, the, the lineage there is the, uh, the ABS IL project that came out of Microsoft Research, and also to a certain extent the ILX project as well. Um, and just to kind of touch on it briefly, um, this is deserving of way more attention, but I'm going to focus on the compiler today. Um, the runtime F-sharp core DLL, basically, uh, it's sort of what makes F-sharp F-sharp. It contains many of the intrinsics that people take for granted as syntax in F-sharp. Um, it's intimately tied to the compiler um, just because of the optimization phase, the way we inline, the way we interact with it. Um, and uh, kind of a, an interesting note is that it's binary compatible across .NET 2.0 and 4.0. Um, Don was pointing out earlier how the tuple type was introduced for .NET 4.0, and um, we actually emit .NET tuples um, when appropriate on 4.0, and then we inject that IL from the MS Core Lib on 4.0 uh, into fsharp.core, use type forwarding on 2.0. So, I mean, really, if you're not a .NET hacker, what that means is that you get an identical, identical semantics for certain types that are shared with the platform across uh, .NET versions that may not contain those foundational types. And I can touch on that later if anybody's interested. Um, so now we're going to take a little quick look into, you know, the broader stages of compilation for the F-sharp compiler. Um, and then I'm going to give you some pointers to places you could look for more information if there are any phases or constructs in the F-sharp language that you're interested in investigating further. 
Um, so to a certain extent, the F# -sharp compiler is a, a fairly orthodox compiler, the, the ML family of, um, of, of compiler technology, basically. Um, there isn't too, anything too controversial in you know, the stages of compilation, both the front end, you know, the, the type checking and optimization phase, and um, the back end. Um, but from a .NET standpoint, there, there is some really cool technology in there. And that because there's sort of that, um, we, we were a slightly higher level language in, in, in some regards to say C-sharp and VB, where they could almost transliterate their languages you know, from say you know, the, the native C-sharp VB syntax to what's represented in IL. Some, some of our transformations are a little bit more involved. Um, so there's actually some really nice technology in the compiler for translating those things. For example, the ILX project, which um, basically can, you can use certain macro IL instructions to say generate closures or, or things like that. Um, so starting with the front of the compiler, I'll work my way back and just give pointers to where you can investigate some of the source code there. Um, there's really nothing too controversial about the, uh, the front end of the compiler. Um, you know, basically collects source code files, parses command line arguments in both Unix or Windows style formats. So if you're running on mono on you know, the Mac or on Unix, or if you're running on mono or .NET on Windows, you could still have a, a familiar environment with which to code in. Um, just calling out a fsc.fs and fscops.fs are the two files you would look in inside the compiler if you want to investigate that a little bit further. And also worth calling out um, some of the things that Tomas was looking at before. Um, if you're interested in maybe taking the front of the compiler DLL and plugging it into other third-party environments, uh, those files I call at the bottom are the ones that you'd want to investigate. Um, those contain, at least right now, what makes up our rudimentary source code services API. Um, the next step in compilation is to instantiate the compilation environment. Um, there are a couple of phases there that we have to go through. Um, first is creating the type checking configuration object, which is basically aggregates some of the options that a user would pass in the front end of the compiler to, to direct compilation. Um, also stores references, build options, things that would be needed later on in the compiler. We keep on touching back to that object later on. Um, and then it resolves assembly references. So if you reference a certain DLL on the front of the compiler during compilation, this is where we figure out exactly which reference DLL you're, or assembly that you're, you're speaking about. Um, on Windows, we fall back to MS Build to do that. On Mono and other platforms, we have some fallback logic that can use heuristics to figure out where you might be looking for that assembly. Um, so that tends to be the case with a lot of the compiler twos that we, we have sort of paid close attention to. We, we don't want this to be too Windows-centric. We want it to run on a variety of .NET platforms. So if there are places where we can sort of you know, avoid relying too heavily on things that might not run well on mono, or if we can mitigate that, we, we always try hard to do that. Um, and then one thing worth noting as well is that for the source code services, uh, we'll cache the foundational references of the compiler. So during compilation, there are certain common references that almost every project uses. Um, like in Visual Studio, when we ship a template for an f -sharp program, we you know, implicitly include certain DLLs. And those will get cached across um, various invocations of the background compiler, say, if you're running Mono Develop or Visual Studio. Um, so it works nicely for performance reasons, although if you're doing multi-targeting, like again, if you have a project for .NET 2.0 and you switch to 4.0, um, sometimes that can introduce some complications if the references are stale. Um, next up is that we um, import any kind of system references. Um, so again, I just want to mention that you know, we read bit to bit, which is kind of unusual for a managed compiler. Um, so this is kind of a cost up front that we have to sort of eat if we, you know, to, to do modulation on the platform. Um, and then there's some validation there as well, making sure that the .NET runtime and also our runtime, the metadata versions agree. So if you're not using like a, a 2.0 runtime to compile against 4.0 or something like that, things that would, might potentially lead to insidious bugs, we try to cut off at the knees at that point. Um, we don't reference user assemblies just yet. We wait till a little bit later on um, once we've done the parse checking phase. And then as well, um, one important thing to kind of mention, it kind of circling back to how we have sort of higher level semantics than some other .NET languages. Um, when we reference an assembly, we do make a distinction between something that was compiled in F-sharp and something that was compiled, say, in IL, like C-sharp or VB. Um, if it's F-sharp, we can kind of carry forward certain language semantics that you know, uh, may not map in as straightforward a fashion to IL, but, and wouldn't maybe be of as much interest to a C-sharp programmer from an API standpoint, but for optimization reasons or for ease of coding for an F-sharp programmer, we'd want that to sort of surface at the, um, the IL level. So as part of the F-sharp compilation process, we actually have custom metadata tables um, in the IL that we sort of emit. So we can do things like cross-module optimizations or better um, 
you know, say, curry intelligence information, things like that, um, certain niceties that wouldn't be possible if we just relied on, you know, straight IL metadata tables for that. Um, not much really to say about the lexing and parsing phase other than um, if you look at the runtime code, we actually have provisions inside when building the runtime for inlining IL instructions. So if you want to do something, uh, well, within the runtime um, in a, a super efficient fashion, you could say, okay, just use these IL instructions. And we actually have a separate parser for those that we, um, that we use. And we also have a, a concept inside the runtime of static optimization conditionals where our implicit compile time type specialization of generic functions. So you can basically inline a specialized invocation which, um, or the body of a specialized invocation that may not necessarily um, agree across different, uh, different types so for, for various optimization reasons. So for example, um, if I were to emit code to test for equality between two integers and two floating point values, um, those might result in different IL being generated for something that's conceptually similar. And for those kinds of operations, we could just inline the IL directly based upon those type specializations. That's pretty cool. Um, so now moving into sort of the middle phase of the compiler, um, we team kind of refer to the type check phase. Um, it's actually way more than type check, and it's almost an injustice to kind of squeeze this phase into only a couple of sides. Um, but I just want to kind of uh, touch on some of the things that are going on here. Um, basically, a lot of sort of, you know, the, the magic of F-sharp happens in this phase. Um, from transforming the AST, we get out of the parse phase to a typed AST. Um, and a lot of it's just, you know, traditional uh, compiler implementation details, such as, you know, setting up symbol tables and name resolution. Um, this is where we, you know, do constraint solving and type safety checking. Um, pattern compilation, you know, um, units of measure, type erasure, things like that. Um, so uh, I just kind of wanted to call out some of the, um, there's, there's a lot there, and um, if anybody wants to talk to me about various phases later, I just wanted to call out those uh, specific areas of the compiler where you can go looking for those things, and I can provide pointers to whatever you might be interested in. Um, and then you know, a couple of other things that happen there are um, we augment certain structural types for equality and comparison operations to better fit into the .NET platform where, say, like equals or get hash code or expected methods on certain types that would normally have referential semantics, but we want structural equality semant or comparison semantics. Um, and you know, we also verify um, signature and implementation uh, parity there as well. And we, off the back end of that, we, this is where we generate the F-sharp pickled metadata. So once we have you know, um, end to end type information on certain things, this is where we create those custom metadata tables. Um, post type check, uh, we do a lot of sort of .NET niceties here, you know, generating MS XML docs. Um, writing the signatures to pickled format, again, both for, you know, interrupt between tools and also so we can kind of speed certain things up in, say, um, uh, development environments. So, for example, rather than have to go through source code services APIs to get, like, signatures for XML docs to get good IntelliSense, um, it's right there in the assembly. Um, we do, for a, a managed compiler, have an extremely aggressive optimization phase. Um, and. You know, part of it is just because, you know, since we're dealing with certain high-level concepts, we want to optimize more because we have better type information than, say, something like C-sharp. We, we have the capability to optimize more. Um, we do a lot of, you know, the traditional op like optimizations that you would expect from a production compiler. Um, but we also have some stuff that's, you know, crucial to having a good functional language implementation on a managed platform, such as, you know, top-level uh, representation lambda lifting, um, detupling, so you can save on tuple allocations if you're you know, uh, trying to map, say, a tupled uh, lambda representation to an untupled one for like a, a .NET method call. And again, cross-module optimizations where we can actually inline method bodies across um, modules, and that's afforded by the fact that we have that custom metadata there. Um, so then from the actual middle end, we're kind of reaching into the back end of the compiler, uh, we, what we do is we'll actually walk the TST to generate um, this extended version of .NET IL that's called ILX. Again, that was a, a separate research project. Um, and that can kind of capture, that it's IL that basically can capture certain higher level functional programming concepts and semantics that um, we can translate to IL in a, a more type directed fashion. Um, so we use this, you know, for everything from closure generation to sequence expressions to um, discriminated union erasure. Um, and I just have a couple of pointers here for anybody playing at home if you're interested in kind of taking a look at, you know, the compiler source or places where maybe we could, um, you know, work on performance or things like that. You know, one thing we've been talking over a lot is just kind of the way we walk ILX to IL. Um, and then after that, we basically um, use the, for FSI, we'll use the reflection emit to compile down some of the IL, or ILX to .NET IL, or the IL right back end to blast it out to a binary file. Um, the F-Sharp compiler is also capable of static linking, and you can do certain amounts of IL injection there, which um, we'll play into some of the things Don will be talking about later. Um, so that's where that would occur in the compiler. And from a, um, more pedantic standpoint, 
the compiler can target you know traditional Windows PCOF files for a variety of platforms or no platform if you just want to run in a purely managed fashion. Um, we do support generation of debug data for both Windows PDB format and um, thanks to Tomas, the mono sim using the mono symbol writer APIs to do some DBs on mono. Um, one thing that we do to um, compile native resources into the assembly is shell out to CVT res exe on Windows. Obviously, that's not available on Mono, so that's another opportunity for extensions if anybody's interested, you know, playing around with the open source release, um, just doing that by hand. Um, and then we also can do strong, strong name signing assembly by just platform invoking um, the uh, MS Core U, which is the platform evaluation engine for .NET. All right, sorry to move so fast through it, but I know it's a bit of a fire hose. Um, does anybody have any questions about uh, anything that's touched on so far? Again, I just wanted this to be sort of a, a pointer to what we've released today, how you could work with it further, and anybody's welcome to come talk to me if there's any aspects of the language or runtime they're interested in kind of diving in deeper, and I can sort of give them pointers too. So during the optimization phase, it's more straight line type directed optimizations. There are some things we kind of do because, I mean, there are certain best practices on the platform that are, you know, in, ter in terms of like, you know, substitutions and stuff. It's like, okay, obviously we want to do that. Um, but for the, the more JIT type stuff, we, we tend to take the approach of either when we're doing the transformation from ILX to IL, the back end, we'll account for some of those um, because, you know, JIT optimizations on one platform, say on Windows.NET, may not be the same on, you know, say Mono. There might be better optimizations on Mono in certain circumstances, better than the others. So we want to kind of isolate those away from the broader optimization engine, which we want to run identically on each platform. Um, then also going back to some of the static optimization conditionals that we have inside the runtime for both inlining IL and just doing more, you know, type directed static compile time specialization of generic functions. Um, those tend to work w work out well nicely for those. So if there are certain, say, IL instructions that we know would be compiled to one way, if we were just going to call through a library function, we have the opportunity to just inline the IL directly for something a little bit better. Like um, I was explaining to someone earlier, like uh, for example, conversions from say. F uh, you know, IEEE, some five four like doubles to longs, like doing that kind of 64-bit conversion, then maybe there's a slightly better way to do that than the .NET library functionality in there. We can just straight away inline that. Okay, well, thanks very much, so. Jeff. All right. So now you've heard about something which has actually been done and being done, and this is a brand new project from Microsoft Research to bring F Sharp into the hands of students at an even higher level than open source. So I'm going to introduce to you here Dean Guo from Microsoft External Research. He's a principal program manager there. And Christoph Poulain, who's also going to do some of the demos. And they're going to speak about try F Sharp in a browser. Thanks, Judas. Um, again, uh, my name is Dean Guo. I'm a principal uh, research program manager at Microsoft Research. This is our agenda. Um, I'm going to talk about the basic context information for the project. And then uh, Christoph and I are going to do a couple of demos. Don has already uh, talked about F Sharp as a programming language, as he said. F Sharp is about writing simple code to solve complex problems. And Tomas uh, talk about uh, interactive mode. And Joe talk about the Ripple. <laughs> so if you think about try F Sharp in a browser, essentially we're trying to bring the Ripple experience into a browser. So Ripple, again, stands for read, evaluate, print loop. Uh, we have a, a problem to solve. Um, let's say, uh, typically, to be proficient in a programming language, um, it takes about 
100 hours. Again, there are many factors to determine uh, how long it takes. Let's say it's 100 hours, but we want to make sure a student has really good experience going through 10 minutes, 10 hours, and 100 hours. And we believe the first 10 minutes and 10 hour experience are critical for the future interests of programming experience. So 10 minutes means we want to enable uh, students to go from why and what to try the programming language and get the basic programming concept. And then in 10 hours, we really want to enable students to download a compact development environment and going through tutorials and write simple applications. And then after that, they know the language, now they're ready to download the integrated development environment into their desktop of choice, and then they can develop uh, real world applications. So the, uh, we're developing this Try F Sharp in a browser project. We're really developing a web-based solution. Uh, the purpose of that is really to make sure there's a smooth transition on different stages, the 10 minutes experience, 10 hour experience, and 10, uh, 100 hours uh, above. So the first experience about zero download. Um, in this case, F Sharp code will be running on the, a web server. Uh, so there's zero cost to try it. Of course, uh, to run F Sharp on the server, there are limitations because we cannot enable every feature of F Sharp. Uh, for example, uh, network related APIs or file inputs and outputs. So the next level of experience is about leveraging the rich internet application uh, experience. So in that case, uh, the F Sharp code actually runs on the client. And uh, this enables students to try uh, different advanced features, for example, asynchronous programming and um, UI related programming. And of course, uh, for, to, to make that happen, uh, the product team actually has provided the F Sharp uh, compiler for Silverlight. Uh, Silverlight, again, is a, a platform uh, from uh, Microsoft to develop rich internet applications. So uh, with that compiler, um, it actually is downloaded on the client. And then uh, by using the browser, you can get the Ripple uh, experience uh, by trying uh, F Sharp. And of course, we're going to provide the tutorials so that students can follow the tutorials, run the code. And for Mac and Linux users, um, of course, they need to download a mono, a moonlight to enable this feature. But the goal is really to make sure that uh, students can quickly set up a compact, a lightweight uh, development environment on their uh, workstations. And actually, for people who know uh, F Sharp, and this uh, Ripple uh, experience is always helpful for prototyping, evaluating different <laughs> algorithms, and so forth. And uh, we realize the course materials are critical for the uh, learning experience. And we do want to provide the ability for instructors to customize and share the course materials. And you just saw the, uh, today's announcement, the compiler, the F Sharp compiler is actually open sourced. And in our, for our solution, we're, open, we're planning to open source that as well. And our target date for this solution uh, is in quarter one, uh, 2011. And I think the beta will be available in early uh, January. Of course, we cannot do this project you have a question? Um, well, I was just wondering, is, is uh, one is geared towards programming, or is some of this geared towards um, you know, a hybrid approach to like, uh, social life with F-sharp and then you're also? So for the, the, 
the focus is really about to uh, make it easy for students and, and instructors uh, and to go through this learning uh, stages uh, in terms of teaching and customizing the material in terms of teaching other programming aspects. There are great resources available on the internet. Uh, we're going to provide links, but we're not going to cover everything. So we're going to have just target these specific uh, uh, audience and for the specific purpose. So of course we're not doing this, we cannot do this project alone. Uh, we are working with different teams within Microsoft. Uh, we're working with uh, MSR Cambridge, uh, led by Don Stein. And he's really a good advisor for our uh, project. He actually uh, participating, uh, providing code samples, actually uh, participated in the development process as well. And the f -sharp team is pro has provided us the Silverlight-based uh, F-Sharp compiler. And we're working with academic partners. And we want to make sure the tutorials we create are really targeted for uh, academic audience, for students. So this is the summary of our key scenarios and personas. I'm happy to announce that the Try f -sharp solution will be hosted on www.tryfsharp.org. Uh, this site is live today. Uh, of course, you cannot try F Sharp online yet. Uh, stay tuned uh, until uh, early next year. And uh, really, the key scenarios for uh, students and instructors is we want to make sure this is the best available website to enable students to go through the quick learning uh, stages and then allow instructors to customize tutorial materials and uh, share the tutorial materials. And the uh, uh, sharing is critical in this case actually uh, we feel that the, the likelihood of an instructor to customize the uh, tutorial is very high because uh, F-sharp is relatively new. Uh, actually, yesterday I was uh, at the dinner uh, with uh, Professor Nigel Horsepool. Uh, we were talking about this topic. And in his view, maybe in two or three years, uh, there will be less need to customize uh, tutorial materials, but at this moment, uh, people will need to uh, look at other people's material and customize it. And, and the, in the future, I'm really hoping that uh, we're going to have a standard, robust tutorial so everybody can use with minimum modifications. So here are some existing try it solutions. There are many on the internet. I just have three examples here. Try Ruby, if you go to tryruby.org, you see a console right away. Uh, from here, you can get a quick 15 minutes tutorial. And after that, you can start trying the language. And try Python, uh, if you bring out a website, as a serverlight based. Uh, the nice thing is about this site, it uh, presents both the tutorial and the console side by side. And you look at the tutorial. If you want to use the code in the tutorial, you can copy the code directly to the console. You don't need to type anything, and you can run the code. And Pax for Fun is a very interesting uh, website. It's a, it's a group in Microsoft Research. Uh, they developed this website, <coughs> and you can try different programming languages, uh, you can compare them. You can uh, practice programming skills in C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp. And it brings the gaming uh, mindset into this learning experience. Uh, I actually play this, play, uh, try to solve a couple of puzzles. And I feel like I'm competing with the computer because the computer tells me I was wrong. And I try to prove that I'm right. 
So it's really uh, getting competitive and, and also allows uh, users to provide additional uh, problems to solve. And we're working closely with them and we want to leverage what they have done uh, especially in the zero download experience running the code on the server because they have done a lot of research in terms of what to enable, what to disable, and we want to integrate that experience and then bring that into Try F Sharp project. So with that, uh, I'm going to show what the website will look like. Again, this is uh, really a sketch view. It, it's like, think about, I'm drawing that on a piece of paper. Uh, before we get the UI experts involved. This is really about what we want to cover. And then Christoph is going to cover how, what, how it's going to look like when you run uh, F Sharp in a browser. So this is the uh, web frame. I use uh, Microsoft uh, Expression Blend uh, sketch flow just kind of a quickly draw what the uh, website will look like. So this is the home page. Uh, there are keywords that we want to describe what F sharp is, why F sharp. In, the, in this case, we have functional and web oriented, parallel and fun. And then the discover uh, allows you to transition to the learning mode. This is the uh, Silverlight, uh, the site that so you can download the Silverlight control so you have a richer experience. And the build is for, for students to get complete uh, integrated development environment on different platforms. And teach is for uh, instructors to look at teaching materials and customize it. So look, let's look at this uh, landing page. And here, um, I'm going to navigate through different tabs. So for example, in the functional, what you see is the sample code uh, to explain what functional means. And then you can actually run the sample. And in this case, it's really zero download experience. And uh, if you want to go through other samples, you can go to parallel. And then you can see what parallel means by looking at the sample code. And if you want to try the F sharp, you can go to here and type syntax there and then execute. And you can compare uh, samples with different uh, programming languages. In this case, we want to, to show, OK, what's the comparison between C sharp and F sharp for different samples, Java as well. And then let's go to the discover page. Uh, Christoph is going to cover uh, more about this page. Basically, uh, on the left-hand side, we have tutorial contents. On the right-hand side, it's similar to the F-Sharp Interactive Console. Uh, there's a code window, and there's the interactive window. And uh, let's imagine you are an instructor, and then you customize the tutorial material, and you store that on the cloud somewhere, and then you have a URL available, and you give this URL to your student. As a student, I can uh, provide a URL in this box. So what we want to do is we provide the uh, customization of loading the custom scenarios by having students open that specific tutorial, and then you can uh, run through uh, that. And for the build page, this is about uh, providing the choice and make it really easy to tell where you can get the uh, downloads for uh, development environment for uh, Linux, for Mac, for Windows, uh, how it works. And for instructors, we really want to make it easy to customize the tutorial materials and so you can share that with other people. Now uh, I'm going to switch. Uh, Christoph is going to demonstrate how actually it's going to work for the zero download experience and the server light experience. I have a microphone. Is it on? Okay, good. 
So it's not necessarily going to show you how it's going to work in the end, but it's more what I like to call a, a concept demo, where uh, instead of just showing you wireframe, we've taken actually pieces that we are working and put them into what may be a more realistic um, uh, solution that we want to shoot for. So if we look at uh, this web page, basically, I'm running in um, Internet Explorer i9 in this case. And if we focus on the right side of, of uh, the page, we have uh, basically a little edit box where you can write code, and then you can hit run, and then you get the output of your program. So the way we enable that is basically what we call a zero download experience. All you need is a web page, and then the code that you write is sent to a server. The code is compiled, you get the output, and the output is returned to you. So the way we achieve that right now is by using um, the engine that was developed for, by the pex for fun uh, website, which is a website put out by a team at Microsoft in software engineering, where they provide an environment where you can learn about programming by a sort of doing it in a fun way, where you, you provide a program with a puzzle method, and that puzzle method could have multiple arguments, and then the PEX engine will try to inject different inputs and show you where your program may fail or may not fail. So that's why in that code right now, I, I must have a puzzle method, which is the main entry point for the PEX engine to recognize my uh, program, my F-sharp program. But we're working towards removing that so that you can truly print, print FN, Hello World in that window, hit run, and then experience the F-sharp language in a matter of seconds without any installation required. And of course, you, you can uh, solve a more advanced program so the, the model we're sort of working towards is one where you have that multi-pane uh, interface for the, the tutorial mode. And on the left side, basically, you have instructions that guide you through what you are learning. That left pane is HTML, so it's very flexible to author, and you, you can put a lot of information. Uh, so in that case, there's uh, basically instructions that guide you through what the experience is. And then there's a sample program, which is a Fibonacci program. So eventually what we would like to have is a try button, which you can click, and then the code will automatically be copied to the edit box, and then you can click run. We don't have that fu functionality in place with the PEX engine, but I can just copy and paste. I can also resize my window so I can see my code, and then I can run it. And here it is, I have the result. So again, it's a zero download experience. Because it's HTML, as I mentioned, and we still have prog you know, work to do on making sure that it displays nicely on, on every screen, on, uh, on different kinds of machine and browsers and so forth. But basically, I can uh, jump to the next part of the tutorial. I have another example, which I'm also going to run. So copy, paste. And this next example actually uh, is that fetch uh, web page example that we've seen in multiple talks already today. And if I try to run that in the PEX engine, up, I get an error. And what it's telling us really is that the PEX engine is telling us, I'm trying to compile code on the server, but you're using uh, DLLs that I'm not allowing. And those DLLs have to do with accessing the network and doing I.O. And so basically for security reasons, they have to remove that. And so that's something we're going to have to live with. And it means that you get a zero download experience. You can experience the language, but there are limitations to what you can do. But at least you can, in a matter of minutes, get started. And then if you're interested and you want to do more, then we can go to the next experience, which is a silver light experience, which I'm going to show you now. So it's the same concept. On the left side, we have a tutorial. And on the right side, we have that uh, window where you can type code, run it, and see the output. So the difference now is that the right side of the window now is a Silverlight application. So it's that rich internet application. And the Silverlight technology, what it, it's, what it does that is important to us, it basically it gives us a sandbox on the client where the .NET framework is running. And therefore, we can run the f -sharp compiler. And we can run f -sharp Interactive. So that I can come to that edit window, type the standard hello world, for high for short and it go, and it will run. And so right now, you can see that as the compiler runs, there's a little bit of a warmer process the first time, but here is the output of my uh, session. So now I can take my um, same, um, yes, you have a question? Yeah. 
so, so the first one, the advantage is that you don't need to use Silverlight, for example. So it's a just a plain web page experience. So on whatever platform you are, you don't have to download Silverlight. The downside of the first experience is that you're sort of limited in the type of code and experience you can have. When we move to the second experience, then Silverlight is required, which means that it works on Windows, it works on the Mac, and it also works on, on Linux. But on Linux, we have to be uh, very conscious to target the uh, Moonlight implementation, which will restrict us to the uh, version of the uh, .NET version that we can use because they're, they're lagging uh, you know, their effort. Uh, the advantage of being in that mode, if you commit to it, is that there are a few things now that you can do that you could not do in a client-server interaction. And so for example, if we take that web page example again, and so now this time I can hit the try button and the code gets copied to uh, the window. So I could hit the go button to run everything, but one thing we can do as well, which is similar to the Visual Studio experience, is select code and then hit, instead of Alt-Enter, because Alt-Enter actually will maximize the browser, which has the Control-Enter key. But, so if I hit Control-Enter, then that uh, code is sent to the compiler, and then we have, it may be hard for everyone to read, but at the very bottom, we basically we've defined a get HTML function, which gets a, a string and return um, an async object. And so why did we have to do that? It's because when we operate in the Silverlight sandbox, the uh, web response, get response method is not allowed anymore. You have to use the asynchronous met methods which are begin response and end, end response. If you were to write that code in C sharp, it would actually be a lot of code you have to write. But here, because we're using F sharp, we can use the async feature and we still have uh, a short uh, piece of code which is pretty sweet in my opinion. And so now let's uh, use that method. And another thing that I would like to show you is that you can actually use that load button to go fetch f sharp curves that you may have on your machine this time. So I load that. And what that code does is define the URL for which I want to fetch the page and then invoke a, a, a method to get the page. And again, it's because we're in Silverlight, we have that session of the f -sharp interactive uh, compiler which is active so that I can reuse my function. I, I don't have to rerun the program to make use of it. So now I can click go and then we will see that it fetched the web page and then printed the, the length of the web page right here. So in a nutshell, this is what I wanted to do uh, to show you today where, where we are in terms of technology and how we're thinking about it. But clearly, Silverlight also has its limitation. For example, the web page I have to access here is in my domain. If I wanted to access a web page from another domain, I would be uh, subject to security restriction imposed by Silverlight. Therefore, you know, if you really want to do more, then that's why you need to go down to the next level, which is download the tool for your platform. And we've, talked, we've seen talks that talk about that already today. And the Try F Sharp um, website is essentially trying to guide uh, someone who may not know anything about F Sharp or who may already be proficient about F Sharp and, and show what are the uh, alternatives that you have to go for that 10 seconds experience. I'm curious about F Sharp, tell me more. To I want to learn more, but I don't want to invest a lot of time. To I want to become a developer and you know, I, I really want to use it on my platform and try to guide you through all, all the tools and the ecosystem that we have. So to close, I think there's um, only one more slide. I know we're standing between you and your lunch, so. <laughs> and and that's, that slide is really a, a, a call to action. So basically, today you've heard about our ideas. And first of all, we'd like to know whether it does resound with the community, especially if you, if you are in education. But you know, even if you're not in education, maybe you know people who want to try F Sharp. Do you think that if that resource was available, would you come and use it? Do you think it would be useful? And if not, what should we do to make it truly useful? And then, um, you know, we have ideas on how we can improve the experience. For example, the Silverlight application right now, it's a sort of a very cool experience. There's no intelligence. There's no code highlighting. Another idea that we have that would be uh, neat would be to have, instead of a text output, to have a canvas on which we can do the sort of drawing that uh, uh, we, we saw earlier. So wh what, what does appeal to the community? If you have any feedback, please email us at uh, 
uh, that address, fsharpweb at microsoft.com. Okay. <laughs> or, for, or for the people in, in, in Cambridge, should they please, please talk to us and, and let us know what you think? Because uh, um, we will only be successful with the, the, the F sharp community as a whole. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. We can actually take a couple of questions indeed. Although we had some, yes. I'm, I'm just curious if it was very hard to do this given the different types of browsers that are out there. We tried something like this a couple of years ago, just copying and pasting. And so we're really just starting with the project, and, and so we, we haven't gotten to that stage of making sure that it works well on every platform. Yeah, but right yes, um, but that's something that's you know that's something that we want to achieve, and I think when we have to sort of balance the, the goals of the project. Being cross-platform is something that's very important to us as opposed to having more features. Uh, but that's also where I think the community can help as we have a beta uh, available, because uh, it's only by uh, engaging a lot of people that we'll be able to get uh, true testing. Yeah, I was filling in my taxes uh, this weekend and I couldn't do it on my Mac. It was a little bit depressing. Um, <laughs> There you go. Over there. Thanks. I want to see a quick demo of how the, the language works. Um, in terms of teaching in a class, um, I think it's um, less likely to be, you know, applied uh, in a class that was, you know, focusing on an entire, um, uh, you know, using a particular language for a long uh, series of lectures. Because you're going to want to, you know, download the package, and you know, the professor's going to want to supply their own tutorial um, based on their own preferences and their own. Um, you know, needs and desires and, and, and things that they feel are important. But I, having said that, I think it's a, a really valuable uh, tool for a particular um, set of people that want to learn. Uh, yeah, for self-learners, it, it's, it's great. So for people that are a bit more advanced, it seems very valuable. Um, what I so do you think, uh, so, so part of the uh, design that we are planning to do is to provide the out-of-the-box tutorial. Uh, and this is the initial set. Of course, we realize it cannot meet everybody's needs, but at least mm -hmm. as a starting point. Thank you much indeed. Thanks to Dean and Christoph. And uh, we have lunch for one hour, and then we'll be back, and hopefully we'll have our, our national audience back as well. Okay, we're out for an hour. Thank you. <laughs>